I don't know about you, but I'm excited about Psalm 42. It was pretty uh, enjoyable getting ready for this uh, this morning. Um, while most of the Psalms have titles, I have added one of my own because the reality of this is it's, it reminded me of living in light of eternity while our feet are planted in reality. Now, this is not our reality. It's just our current reality, okay? And so this psalm is, is a psalm uh, written by the sons of Korah, uh, temple musicians. Um, while Psalm 42 can stand alone, uh, if you look at your, your Bibles, if you have the, the headings of, uh, at the beginning of each psalm, you'll notice there's not one at Psalm 43. These two psalms are connected. They can be standalone, but there are things that go on in both of them, and I will reference uh, Psalm 43 a number of times this morning. If time permits, we may even talk a little depth of Psalm 43. If not, I'll leave it to your own personal study from there. Um, Psalm, uh, there, like I said, there's only the, the one uh, introduction, and uh, we've heard some uh, big words today. Uh, and I have one. I call it my $5 word because uh, most of you who know me know that I am not a student of the English language. I have enough to get by. It was all I could do to get out of high school uh, with passing English. So uh, I have a word for you this morning. It's called, uh, I had to write it out so it sounds, it's soliloquy. Okay? And what that means for those, I see some of you shaking your heads as if you know what that means. I'm impressed. Uh, but the idea here is it's taking place in this psalm, and the psalmist is, is liking, liking, it's like an actor on a stage having both sides of the conversation. And so you're going to see this time and time again uh, as we go through this. Psalm, first we need power. You're going to see this in Psalm 42, verse 9, where it says, And I say, my God, I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go on mourning, oppressed by the enemy? You see it in Psalm 43. It says very similar things. You are, my, you are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go on mourning and oppressed? And so you see this actor, this psalmist, is, is stating these things that are going on in his world and, and the things, and then this, this verse, Psalm 42.5 and 42.11 and 43.5, or the response to that. So he's asking the question, why are you like this? Why are you uh, so rejected? Why are you then? And then it says in Psalm 42.5, my, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And so you see both sides of this conversation going on. The psalmist says, why are you so downcast? And he says, hey, knucklehead. He says, look at God. Praise him. That's what we have to look forward to. And so you're going to see both sides of this conversation come out in Psalm 42 and 43. The coolest thing that, that I think I took away from this study and from my preparation is it that this psalm is a cry to God. It's a, a, a cry out for believers for today, for right now. That's what was so exciting. What's the cry? That we can look to our God because one day, and we talked about this just a few minutes ago, one day we're going to be in his presence. We, is that not exciting? So regardless, and we'll hear about this, the circumstances that we're faced with, you have this self-communing refrain of the psalmist, this dialogue going back and forth, and the exciting thing for us as believers that we are called to live now in light of eternity. Is that not exciting? So regardless of what we're faced with today, we can handle that. We can have peace. We can be calm because we know what eternity holds for us. That, to me, was exciting. You might find this interesting, too. In Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says that you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Can we not trust in God and have our mind set at peace? 
That's what he's saying to us. He says, why are you so downcast? Remember God. Trust in him, our God and our Savior. Jesus prayed this for us in, in John 17. And, in, and this reads, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my, jo- that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. There are, they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen? Jesus is praying for us here in John 17, and he's saying, Listen, Father, I... I love these ones you have given me don't take them necessarily out of the world but give them the peace that they need to endure but protect them from the holy from the evil one excuse me and so he's he's praying these things and and setting us apart from this world which speaks to me of living in light of eternity while we have to muddle in the mud and the muck of this life and so i think hebrews chapter 12 Verses 1 and 2 says this best. And it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and we know the witnesses that we're talking about here are from chapter 11, the great hall of faith, right? Everybody's aware of that. And he says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is our example. Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the Sinless One, took on flesh, bore my sin to Calvary's cross, and endured that, endured the shame, endured the, 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 the crucifixion at the hands of wicked men, like myself, looking beyond that to the joy that was set before him. And that joy is not only his resurrection, ascension, and seated at the right hand of the Father, but it's bringing us to that place as well. So we're going to be gathered to see Jesus in all of his glory. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what we can look past this current environment and say, This is exciting because I'm going to be gathered around the throne of Jesus and see him in all of his glory and be able to praise him. And so, and then in John 10, 10, it reads, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. What he's saying is, is this life that we live right here, right now, We don't have to live under the circumstances in light of my circumstances because my circumstances are in heaven. That's what we can live this life and then we can have it abundantly. Is that not exciting? That's what this psalm does for us. This psalm brings us the how-to, if you will, of this process, okay? Um, I get excited and I start to ramble and run on at the mouth and I forgot to give thanks to God before we got started. So before we dig into Psalm 42, we're going to stop and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the, the confidence that we have in you, the peace that we have in you, the, the confidence in your word that it is truth, it's our truth, and it will see us to eternity. We look forward to that day, Lord Jesus. And as we open your word, may we... Uh, be blessed by it. May it be changing uh, of our lives that we will become more like you because of our encounter with your word. We ask these things now in your name. Amen. All right. So our lives are to be lived fully and abundantly, even though this reality stinks. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and I look around and this world stinks. I'm, my wife, okay, she looks at me and she goes, listen, I love you, but I'm ready to go. Every day and sometimes multiple times a day. I told her after a while I start to get a complex a little bit. So, But is that not exciting that we can get up in the morning and get excited about the Lord Jesus coming back because we know what our eternity holds? 
even in light of this craziness that's going on, we can have that peace. This psalm, our psalms are broken into three things. Psalm 42, 1 to 5 is about the drought. 42, 1 to 6, or 6 to 11 is the depth. And 43, 1 to 5 is the release. We're going to look at these as we jump into this psalm. 42, verse 1 through 5 reads. And guys, the music, music team, I love you guys. Thank you for this song this morning. This was just, uh, whew, thrilled my heart. So, as a deer pants for the water's brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, O God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while I continually say, while they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. They why are why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help, for he is the help of my continence. So you have this in, in verse, in Psalm 42 uh, opening, and this first one is talking about the drought. And the psalmist here brings us and draws us this picture of, of the deer that's panting for the water. Have, have you ever been in one of those uh, athletic adventures where you tried to play football or basketball? or You know, those are pretty endure. Soccer has got to be the worst, okay? Because you're playing defense. It's a big field. You're playing offense. And you get done and you're going, <gasps> at least I am anyway. And I'm looking for that panting for a glass of water. You understand that concept? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about that. that, that that's not, excuse me, that's not what he's talking about. That's the heat of the rush. Okay, that's what that is. What he's talking about is that series of drought, that long, agonizing pain. And around here, and I'm from the Midwest, so this is new to me, four years now, uh, it's dry around here. Okay, you go into the mountains, if you're not up in the upper mountain, it's dry, it's desolate, and there is no... I rode up to, is it Silver City? I mean, it's crazy, the dryness out that direction. Okay, just absolutely crazy pales in comparison to what he's talking about. So he's drawing this picture of this deer that is panting for the water, it's drought, and he's likening it, likening it, wow, I got that one out that time, likening it to this drought, is, he's likening to uh, it, it, what it, this psalm is, is written about the exile uh, in the north at, the, at the, the beginnings of the Jordan and the wilderness, and there's just nothing there, and it's dry and desolate, and there's just nothing going on. And he's being reminded of what it was like back at the temple and worshiping God. And so he's drawing this contrast, and he's saying, this drought... This drought is agonizing. This life, our circumstances, can be. But he goes on in Psalm uh, uh, 42, in verse 3. He's painting this picture, this, this thing going on. And he's got in mind for him. Whoops, I'm talking about the drought. See, I get to yakking and uh, forget to do some things. Uh, so in Joel 19, uh, in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Oh, Lord, you... O oh Lord, to you I cry out, for the fire has devoured the open pastures. The flame has burned the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up and the fire has devoured the pastures. How many of you have been up in the mountains and see the ravaging of the forest fires up there? For me, this is all new. It was devastating. I was just dumbfounded by it. But it speaks of this image here of this drought, this exile, this separation from the worship of his God. And this, this is the, the heart of things. Uh, Jeremiah 14, 1 through 6, it reads, And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Judah mourns and the gates languish. They mourn for the land and they cry for Jerusalem has gone up. The nobles have sent their lads for water and they went 
to the cistern and found no water. They returned and their vessels were empty and they were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads because the ground was parched. For there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Their, the deer also gave birth in the field, but they left because there was no grass. And the wild donkeys stood at desolate heights and they sniffed the wind like the jackals and their eyes failed because there was no grass. You get this concept of this drought, this long agonizing picture that the psalmist is drawing here and he likens this drought to this exile and, he, and this separation from these things. And in verse 2 it says, And my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That's what's on his mind. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was thirsty and I was in this drought and it was this bad, I'd be going, Lord, where's the water at? I, and what he's saying here is, no. Turn that drought into a desire to be with God, to be in fellowship with God, my God, the God of the universe, the Almighty, the one who pours rain on the, on the wicked as well as the righteous, who cares for the animals. Uh, the scripture that talks about how uh, the lilies of the field have never been, that, that Solomon's, all of Solomon's things doesn't even compare because God, our God, has provided these things. And so he, in verse 3 he says, And my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, Where is your God? Even while the world hates us, even while the circumstances, the waves of our circumstances overwhelm us, while the darkness keeps us down, he's saying, No, in light of eternity, live today. And so we don't have to do those things. Romans 8:18 8, says it best. For I consider the sufferings of this present time not to be worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Think about that for a second. Everything that we face, all of the difficulties, the struggles, whether it's like a deer in this desert storm, it pales in comparing to what God has in store for us and will be revealed in us. Why? We talked about it earlier. Where it's going to be revealed because we are His righteousness. It's because of Him that we will have this, not because of us. And so it is truly exciting. Psalm 42, verse 4 and 5 read, And when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go to the mul I used to go with the multitude, and I went to, went with them to the house of God, and with the voice of joy and praise, and with the multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. Stop there for just a second. Think about this. Okay, this psalm has some. Uh, it's not clear if this was the psalmist was writing this uh, as the one who was leading worship or was participating in the worship. Okay? And I think it's immaterial. And I think it says to us, regardless of whether you're leading worship or participating in worship, the, the, the crux of the matter here is public worship of our God. Okay? And that's what he's bringing us to. And he's saying, listen, in light of this drought, in light of this famine, in light of the circumstances that are coming over us, he says, remember these things. What things? You've heard the, you know, think about those of you who have been saved a long time. Larry, you've been saved the longest, I think, in the room. And Larry shares it with us on a regular basis. But he goes back to that moment. You remember what it was like when you trusted Jesus and you knew you were saved? That was pretty exciting, wasn't it? That's what he's saying. In this drought, in this time, in this difficult moment, go back and remember what it was like when you received Jesus. In this case, remember what it was like when they went with the, those who kept the pilgrim feast, when they went to the house of God. And that's what he's talking about. So remember these things and do them. Do what you did at first. And that's the idea. It's about the public worship of our God. 
And he goes on in verse 5 and says, and why are you cast down? So you get this image of this actor or the psalmist going, why are you cast down? Why, oh my soul, why are you so disquieted within me? He says, hope in God, okay, is what he's saying. Now, we all know when I say hope in God, we're not going, whew, I hope I get to heaven. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. Hope is confidence in the future that we know exactly what's going to take place. And do we not know what's exactly going to take place? Now, we don't have a clue how great heaven's going to be. But we do know that it's going to be great and that we're going to be there. Okay? That's what he's talking about. He says, don't be downcast. Don't be disquieted. He says, hope in God. That's our future. Keep your eyes fixed in eternity, even in light of this current drought. That's what he's saying to us. Remember the things that you did at first. Now, in Psalm 42, 6 to 11, it reads, I'm going to turn the page so I can actually read it. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, and from the hill of Mizar. Deep calls to the deep, the noise of your waterfalls, all your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do you, I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the breaking of my bones, my, <clears throat> as, the break, as with the breaking of my bones, the enemy's reproach, while... They say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him and for the help of my continents and my God. You see, Psalm 42, verse 11, same thing as 42, 5. He's reminding us, but this is a completely different picture here. He's gone from the external, from this drought, from this suffering of, of famine, and he's turned it inward now. And he's talking about that inward drought. He's talking about how things feel and how our hearts feel and how our attitudes are. It's no longer the external circumstances, but it's the same picture. Even when our hearts are downcast, it's the same picture. Hope in God hope in God, hope having your eyes set on the future. In Genesis 1-2, it talks about um, how uh, the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was, was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Think about that darkness, that, that place of despair for just a minute. Some of us have experienced some of those. We've had some of those experiences in this life. We've had those times where we felt the despair. We felt the heavy weight. We felt that there was no answers. And in Jonah chapter 2, verse 3, unlike Jonah, but I think the idea that initially crossed his mind, think about this. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and all the billows of your waves passed over me. Now, listen, we all know that Jonah got this because he didn't do what God told him to do, okay? So this is separate, but the idea that these floods surrounded him, that they overwhelmed him, it's the cast of where our hearts are as we try to live in this world because it can be a challenge. You could be uh, in the workplace and you are abused because of your faith. You could be a stay-at-home mom and feel overwhelmed by uh, three children that are just zapping every ounce of energy that you could possibly have and you do not have time to meet with our God. You could be a senior who is lonely and by themselves. All of these things, that's what he's talking about is that heart condition of where we stand in this life. But he's saying to us, no. He's saying to us, in Psalm 42, verse 6, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, and from the hills. He's saying, remember when you got saved 
and how excited you were? Remember what it felt like when I delivered you from your sin? Remember what it was like when you realized that you were no longer under judgment, that I paid for your sin? Is that not what he's... So in those dark moments, he's saying, remember what I did for you. Remember these things. In Psalm 42, verse 4, he says, And when I remember these things, I used to go with the multitude. I went to the house of God with the voice of the joy and praise and with the multitude that kept the pilgrim peace. So you have this idea that the psalmist is either leading or going in this group, and they're going back to the temple, and they're going to meet with God himself and worship him. That's what he's calling us to do. In remember what it was like and remember what I did for you and don't get caught up in the things of this world. Live in light of eternity even in these circumstances, even as the waves billow over us, even as the darkness and despair comes upon us. Remember God. Remember the things. Pour out your soul to God and he will meet you there. That's what he's calling us to do. And so you have these things uh, in Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, 11, it reads, why are you downcast, O my soul, and why, and why are you disquieted within me? And I've said this how many times already this morning? A lot, right? Okay, it says it three times in, uh, in 16 verses of Psalm 42 and 43. You heard the old saying that if the scriptures tell you to do something once, it's, it's important. It tells you twice, it's really important. And if you hear it a third time, holy cow, you better sit up and take notice. Okay? This is the second time, and at 43 verse 5, it's the exact same thing. So I think it's pretty important. And so you have this conversation of the psalmist asking, why is it that I'm so downcast? Because I remember what God told me. Why is my soul disquieted in me? I remember what God has done for me, and I remember the joy of praising him with his people. Right? Are you carrying on both sides of this conversation in your Christian life today? I would venture a guess that most of us are. Because the billows keep coming. The waves keep coming the darkness, the despair. It could be any number of things. I have four sons, and they have, uh, have not walked with the Lord. I could be in despair over that. I, and I am, don't misunderstand, but it's not going to darken the eyes of my soul to praising my God because I shall yet praise him when I get to eternity in glory and I can do it now because I see what's going to happen in glory I can still live it today I can because of what's in glory I can do it abundantly and I can do it with not just surviving this life but thriving in this life that's what the psalmist is talking about here and so it kind of it, it goes on and I'm just going to kind of try and tie this all together, if you will, for just a second. Psalm 42, 9 says, And I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the, oppos because of the opposition of the enemy? And so you have this, this statement, this dialogue that's going on back and forth. And then in Psalm 43, verse 2 reads, And you, for you, God, whew, I'll try that again. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go on mourning because of the opposition of the enemy? So you have this dialogue going on in why is this so difficult? Why? And we plead and pour our hearts out to the God, our God. And it goes on in 42.10. As with the breaking of my bones, the enemies reproach the en my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? How many times have you heard someone say to you, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. If God is so loving, why are people suffering so bad? If God is so good, why are things so bad here? 
Why? Because of sin, not because of God. God has given us eternity and a glimpse of what that's going to look like. And so what he's saying is, is regardless of the drought, regardless of the famine, regardless of that panting, regardless of the condition of our souls, that the weight on our souls, the weight on our minds, the things that weigh us down, no, live in light of eternity. Psalm 43, 42, 11 sums it up, and we've talked on this a number of times already. 42, 5 and 43, 5 got the exact same thing. And this is just one more proof that we can live in light of eternity even in the realities of this world is what he's telling us. And we need to keep our minds stayed on God himself, stayed on God's faithfulness, stayed on his promises. Why? Because we know that one day I will yet praise my God in eternity. We talked about it. Someone was sharing about it this morning, that we're going to be in eternity seeing Jesus in all of his glory. And if that doesn't excite you, check your pulse, okay? Holy cow, because to me that's exciting. All this garbage that we deal with day in and day out, in light of eternity, it's exciting to know that I will yet praise God. Even when I fail, even when, because Scripture tells us, God, Jesus paid for my sin in the past, the present, and the future, the ones I haven't even committed yet. I'll do it this afternoon on the way out the door, okay? But in light of all those things, I can yet praise my God. That's exciting. And so the psalmist here sums this up in these verses and says to us that, listen, this is is not just a psalm about a deer that's longing for a drink of water, okay? It's not about all the other things that that, the, the soul that's downcast. It's about praising God and public worship of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, because that's where the real joy comes from. That's where the real comfort comes from, is in praising our Savior. And so he goes on and says, uh, I'm sorry, he doesn't go on, because that's the end of the psalm, okay? And I get to stop, and I'm not only a couple minutes over, all right? Psalm 43 is pretty awesome, though. Um, and, and just two quick comments, because I was going to end here, but Psalm 43, the release, just two verses. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against the ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and the unjust man. Are we not going to get that deliverance? That's what he's talking about when you talk about the refreshing. And the other one is from Psalm uh, 43, verses 3 and 4. O send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. That's the release he's talking about, guys. This this release, so that when we go to our God and take joy and comfort in him, he sends his light, he sends his truth, the word of his truth, and it comforts us so that we can live abundantly in this life so that we can go to the altar and praise our God. Our God, my exceeding joy. Is there anything that we shouldn't have more joy in than God himself and our relationship to him? Is this not exciting stuff? And so the psalmist is laying this stuff out, and he, but to me he's saying, hey guys, wake up. This is about you. This isn't about some old dusty psalm. This is about the here and now. This is exciting stuff. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? All right. I'm going to close. This, for me, was, uh, was a joy. Thank you. Let's close. Father, we do thank you for your abundance, gift, and care for us. Your abundant gift in Jesus Christ that made it all possible. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing and that you were the complete and total sacrifice that made all this possible. Oh, for that day we long, where we will yet meet with our God, 
we will be gathered with voices of joy and praise in your presence. Ah, what a comforting thought. We look forward, Jesus, to your return. Where those clouds are going to be rolled back, we're going to hear your voice, the trumpet call, and we will enter into eternity, into your presence. What a joy. What a comfort. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name.